Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this, the uh, ninth webinar in the new barn raising webinar series. Uh, as you can see, today's topic is empowering users, so the users of community and civic assets. Uh, my name's uh, Gareth Potts. Uh, I'm the guy who's been uh, sending you all these emails, and I, I set up this uh, the program uh, earlier this year. Um, in terms of, uh, I don't really want to outline the new barn raising too much. Uh, it's been uh, there is a there is a program website, thenewbarnraising.com. So I hope you're able to uh, sort of take a look at that. Um, and that has a, a range of sort of fr everything on it is free. Uh, there's a free toolkit with practical tips around uh, raising awareness, raising money, and raising volunteer help. Uh, there are summaries of the toolkit, so different articles. Uh, there's also the um, uh, links to the YouTube channel where recordings of past webinars uh, are uploaded uh, and links to the full webinar program for this year. So I hope you can find some time to take a look at that. Uh, today's focus really is uh, pretty much on the, the, the awareness raising aspect of the new barn raising. And really, um, the question is how can, can um, cultural asset users be empowered? Uh, and and to the two two presentations really deal with different aspects of this. So, um, the first presentation is around uh, how can um, you know members of the public, citizens, uh, help to shape museum activities? How can they have an input into what goes on in museums? And then the second presentation is more about giving um, arts users influence and control over public spending. Uh, in this case, a very sort of direct control. So just a word about our, our a few brief words about our two speakers today. Uh, joining us from Edinburgh is Diana Morton. Uh, now Diana is the Outreach and Access Manager for Edinburgh Museums and Galleries, which is a, a City of Edinburgh Council post. Um, and she's been in that role since 2010. Uh, in previous lives, she was a, a Glasgow Museum's uh, Learning and Access Curator and a Learning Assistant. Uh, she's also been an out-of-school learning facilitator for Renfrewshire Council, which is a council in Scotland, and she's been a tour guide at Glasgow School of Art, which is a, a very, very prestigious art school in the UK. Um, the second presenter is Carlos Paiva, who is the Secretary for the Development and Promotion of Culture in the Ministry of Culture in Brazil. He's based in Brasilia. He's in Rio de Janeiro today. Um, he's been in his current role since, since um, spring of this year, since March. Um, prior to that, he has had a, a, a long and distinguished uh, background in the, the state of Bahia, which is on the sort of northeastern coast of, of, of Brazil. Uh, he was been superintendent of cultural promotion for the, the state secretariat of culture for five years from 2009-2014. Prior to that, he was the Chief of Staff for the State Secretary of Culture. Uh, and he was, uh, and then just after graduating uh, in a, with a degree in cultural production from the Federal University of Bahia, he became a producer in music, theater, the visual arts, and cinema. So both presenters have very strong backgrounds in the arts. Um, without further ado now, I'm going to uh, hand you over to uh, Diana in Edinburgh who's going to talk through their uh, excellent uh, work around um, uh, the Citizen Curator, Cur Curator Program. So, Diana, over to you, please. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Diana Morton, and I'm Outreach and Access Manager at Edinburgh Museums and Galleries. Um, just to give you a bit of background, I've been there for uh, five years now, developing the Outreach Program. Um, so I'm going to go into that in a bit. Um, basically, my role is to work for all the council museums and galleries, um, which you can see on the screen in front of you. There's quite a lot of different buildings, such as the City Arts Centre, Museum of Edinburgh, Norriston Castle, and lots of others. And my role is to reach out to those who don't come to our venues for whatever reason, whether it be physical or psychological barriers to access, such as people who feel that museums aren't for them, or people who physically can't get to our venues. Here are a couple of slides just illustrating a bit more about what I do. Um, the slide to the left is a picture of one of my projects called Museums Alive, which is a project 
which is jointly run with Health and Social Care, where we have volunteers going out to day centres and care homes in Edinburgh to run art, reminiscence and music activities and develop exhibitions. And the slide to the right there is a museum I've set up in Victoria Primary School in Edinburgh. And I set up this museum working with the local school and the local older people's group. And we developed an exhibition based on the history of the local area. And the museum's been there for quite a few years now and it's open to the public by appointment. So, yeah, my work's to work with a variety of different audiences from toddlers, older people, people in prisons, mental health groups, schools, all sorts of different organisations. And the reasons for this work is, as uh, Gareth previously, this New Haven Heritage Museum, which actually shut down. And the idea was that we'd have a non-venue based communities where they are and create community displays in partnership with local groups, reflecting community interests that could pop up in a variety of venues and can be changed really easily to reflect people's interest. So the idea is it's a much more sustainable, cost efficient and more flexible alternative to having some more permanent exhibition spaces. And obviously being not based so much in a building means that we can go out to where the communities are and can engage with those who don't necessarily traditionally engage with culture. Obviously, over the last few years, the need for this sort of work has intensified in this age of austerity. There is a need for museums to justify their continued funding and show how the impact on the social and economic well-being of communities and outreach work can really help with this by focusing on the engagement of communities as active participants rather than as passive visitors to museums and galleries. But I'm here to talk about one particular project, Citizen Curator, um, which was a two year outreach project and it was designed to work with young people in Leith. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, Edinburgh, Leith is an area to the north of the city. And it used to be a port which has declined since the industry in the local area shut. There's been a lot of regeneration in recent years, um, but people may be still associated with the urban Welsh novel Train Spotting. Urban Welsh was a famous leather, rather than its current flourishing art scene and you know really diverse area. Um, so the project worked with community organisations to explore the museum collections related to the local area. So it accumulated in an exhibition at the City Arts Centre where we put collections items on display which were chosen by the people involved in the communities and we displayed these alongside their responses such as art and contemporary collecting and documentary film. Now we focused on young people as an audience because our visitor research showed that our visitors tend to be older people at the City Arts Centre and as a service we tend to attract tourists rather than local people um, and young people, especially minority ethnic groups, were generally not people who were engaging with us. So why did we choose to focus on Leith? Well, we have really nice museum collections related to the local area. So this is a picture from one of the exhibition, the finished exhibition, and on the wall of the picture is a painting by Alexander Naismith called The Port of Leith. Um, which illustrates some of the beautiful art collections we have relating to that area. In the display case is a picture of, uh, is a ship model rather, from the collections displayed alongside shipbuilders' tools and dockers' hooks. And the brown thing you can just about see in the corner of the display case is a catfish skin, which is actually in the museum collections, which relates to the local area. So you can see we've got lots of different things that we can put on display. Also, we had items from some of the communities in Leith. Leith is a really diverse area. So we had items such as the shallwear chemise, the outfit that's on display in the mannequin, which we wanted to put on display, but also make really relevant and update. So we worked with local communities to create a film which talks about the sort of diversity of the local area in the, that time, um, which is up on the wall behind that. So. The project was really very much community-led. It was actually developed working with a local artist called Duncan Bremner, 
who came to us to discuss the idea of doing a project about Leith. And he has since gone on to set up his own community arts organisation called Citizen Curator, which runs community arts projects in the north of Edinburgh and is definitely worth looking up if you're interested in this. He does some really good stuff. So we looked at target audiences and approaches and set our aims and objectives. And we managed to get some funding from the Leith Townscape Heritage Initiative for £2,000. So we used that to start our project and we worked with quite a lot of different groups to make the project happen. This picture is from the first group we worked with, which was Home Start Leith in North East Edinburgh, which is a mum's respite group. And we have quite a lot of banners in the museum collection. You can see a picture on the left there of the Lodge of Free Gardeners, their banner, which has a beautiful Leith coat of arms in the centre of it. So with this group, we worked with them to create their own banner, which represented the local area as they saw it which is the image on the top there. And they put in lots of symbols about what they thought the area meant to them. So there was Leith coat of arms, there was a sunshine representing sunshine on Leith, there was a pigeon, there was all sorts of things like people holding children because they were all group, the group was all mothers. Um, and this is what it meant to them. And the bottom picture is the banner on display in the gallery itself. We also worked with Leith Library, which is the local council library in the area. And we ran open workshops for people coming along. Now you'll see in this picture, this is a slightly younger demographic. Um, we did get some older children taking part, but by and large, they didn't come with parents and guardians. So there was no one to sign consent forms for them for the photographs, which is why our photographs tend to be slightly younger children. Um, and we did a lot of sessions on galas and festivals, which these pictures are from, which show the young people making gala figures. And we also did a workshop on sports and identity, where people made their own team t-shirts, and a workshop on Leith landscapes, where we made pictures of Leith and maps. We had a stall as well at Leith Festival, which is a local festival in Leith, um, and we took out images of the art collections to show to people and asked people to vote on what items they wanted to put on display in the exhibition and to tell us why. And the picture that got the most responses out of anything was the one at the back of this picture here, a painting called Great Junction Street by an artist called Jock McFadden. And we got responses on this picture, which varied, as you can see, from people talking about the beauty of the building and their hopes for its future, to people saying it was a very ugly building, to people's memories about going to the building when it used to be a cinema. It's now shut down. Um, and all this, that was really interesting, finding people's responses to these. And we used these comments to create labels for our art exhibition at the end. So we got people's feedback on what these items meant to them. We also worked with Leith Academy, which is a local secondary school. And they created these landscape paintings about the local area, which fitted in in the exhibition you can see on the left there with the other artworks that we had from our collections. And we worked with Young Sahelia, which is an organisation which works with ethnic minority young women. And they created a great film discussing the local area and their backgrounds, the languages they speak at home, their religions, the food they eat, all sorts, which we had displayed, blown up really big in the gallery space, just to bring some life to the exhibition. We also had an artist in residence with a local art school, Leith School of Art, and this is Kat Madden, who was our artist, and she visited our art stores and our history stores. You can see her on the left there with our conservator, Paul, visiting the stores. And she created the piece of artwork that you can see in the, in the slide here um, called Unembellished Culture, which we put up in the gallery alongside the other artworks that we put on display. We also did quite a lot of contemporary collecting in the local area. So... The pictures here are of the exhibition, the final exhibition, and we managed to get a Sunshine on Leith film poster, which very luckily the film came out just before this exhibition launched. A local arts organisation, Leith Late, gave us some um, posters and photographs of their activities, and they also loaned us the Proclaimers record that you can see in the picture on the right, and the bottle of beer as well. And other community organisations and people loaned us some of the other items in that display. We also involved the wider community by having people like Leith Local History Society as proofreaders 
for the exhibition. Um, so they checked all our facts and figures. And one local even worked as a volunteer for photographer on the project. So we pulled together all this material that we'd worked with these groups to create and opened an exhibition in October 2013, which ran till February 2014. So this is a picture of the exhibition. You've seen a few other pictures as we've gone through. So you can see the Jock McFadden paintings up there on the wall, the one that everyone responded to really well. In front of that are these pigeon sculptures, which are part of a sculpture by Shona Kinloch called A Leith Walk, which used to be on display at the top of Elmer Owen Leith, but were taken up for the tram works when that happened. But a lot of people really missed them. There are actually some other pigeons in storage as well, but we wanted to put those ones on display. On the far wall, you can see the artwork by Cat Madden that I talked about and the Leith Academy artworks, but they're mounted alongside a painting by Kate Downey, a picture by Ernest Lumsden and another painting by Kate Downey. So you can see we've mixed up the, you know, the artwork and the community artwork because we were really keen. We didn't want to make this just a community art exhibition because people have attitudes to that. So they'd be less interesting sometimes. But actually, we wanted to add the same value to what the communities were doing to some of the other artworks as well. Um, you can see as well, this picture summarises a lot of what we're trying to do with the project. So we have a sculpture by Eduardo Palozzi, who is a local, art, uh, local elite sculptor who has Italian ancestry. And he has a few sculptures in Leith, for instance, the manuscript of Monte Cassino, which is this big sculpture at the top of Leith Walk with a hand and a foot. Well, we wanted to display that alongside this banner, which is from the Dockers of Leith, which shows you about the you know, shipbuilding and port heritage of the area, the working class traditions. And so this is a really nice mix of you know, fine art, um, stories about migration, and also the heritage of the history of that local area. We didn't want the exhibition to be the end of all this work though, so we had a feedback area where people could tell us their stories about Leith. We had the usual comments book, but we also had these A-frames here where we asked people, what does Leith mean to you? And we got a lot of different responses from people talking about the exhibition to people talking about their memories of the local area, which you can see here with this quote about going to the cinema um, in the 50s and 60s. And some people even drew us pictures, which was great. We got quite a few pictures of pigeons and things like that. Um, so it was a really nice way to get people's responses to the exhibition. And we actually used some of these responses and uploaded them to social media afterwards so we could keep the discussion going. We also did evaluation by having visitor research volunteers in the gallery while the exhibition was on, um, who got a lot of feedback about who was coming to the exhibition and why they were coming to the exhibition and what they thought of it. Mm -hmm. And throughout the project, we carried out evaluation. So we had um, evaluation forms used with all the groups that we worked with to measure the impact of what we we're doing. And evaluation overall was really successful. And a lot of people asked for us to do more of this sort of work. And people were really positive about what we were doing. A lot of people just had suggestions, what more we could have added in or what more we could have done, which was really good. Um, just to sort of pull this together really. Um, I suppose if I was revisiting this project, there's a couple of things that I would have done differently now having run this. Um, the first one was actually about the lifespan of the project. Over two years, we found that a lot of the young people's groups we worked with actually changed participants. And in many cases, the staff changed as well because they were often on short-term contracts. So at the end, when we asked people to come back and visit the exhibition, the finished version of it, we found a lot of the people weren't the same people who had started the project, which was a bit of a shame. So we lost a, sh a contact with some of the people we'd worked with. Also, when the exhibition opened, we found out that a lot of people were offering us objects for the exhibition, images for the exhibition, um, but we hadn't built any flexibility into the exhibition itself to do this. So if I was doing this project again, I would have another display case there so people could display their items and we could update that, maybe have an object of the week, object of the month. Um, so it could be a lot more responsive to communities actually as the exhibition was progressing because the exhibition itself made people really look up and start discussing what we were doing. Um, we did get around this a bit by using social media to show images that people had sent us 
and some of the items that people have told us about and share people's stories and feedback. But obviously, it'd be nice to have a bit more of that in the space as we're going on. So I'm going to finish up in a minute. Um, but if you want to find out more about the project and what I do, here are my contact details. The link at the bottom is a link to my blog, which I update quite regularly, which talks about all the work I do, the different groups I work with. And so it's probably the best source for information if you want to find out a bit more about what, what I get up to. But I think at that point, I will hand back over to Gareth. Thank you very much indeed, Diana. Um, that was wonderful. I really appreciate your reflections on on the project uh, at the end there, and also you know kind of a range of things stood out in terms of initially the fact that you work with all these different partners, health, schools, libraries, um, and that you get f you sort feedback on what you did as well. Uh, and I like the use of volunteers uh, to, for doing for doing the evaluation, um, and I also love the pigeons, of course. Um, but OK, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Carlos in Rio. Uh, so Carlos, over to you, please, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Here's already noon to all. First, I'd like to thank uh, Gareth and the New Barresi for inviting us. It's a great opportunity for us to present the Vale Cultura program. It's one of our youngest programs, and uh, it's the only one which is not focused on the artists or cultural groups, but to the citizen. Um, so it's a broader uh, um, audience we are talking to. Forgive my rusty English. I will do my best to present the program and answer all the questions in the end. <coughs> the Vale Cultura program, um, the the law that uh, creates it, it's from late uh, 2012, but the program actually just started working on August of 2013, so we are just making two years. Of the base of it is we have uh, some very bad is, is statistics of uh, audiences in Brazil, um, showing there 93% never, never went to an art exhibition. 92 never visited a museum, 87 don't go re regularly to movie theaters, and so on. Um, here, uh, this re research uh, relates this this low level of of uh, co cultural practice with the income. So, if you have a better income, you probably go more to museums and everything. So. This is uh, a strong related with the income, and that's where the Valley Cultura program works at. How does it work? Um, well, this is the, this is the only, is the first federal uh, program actually in the whole country that uh, aims to, to put the culture as a basic right for the Brazilian worker. Um, the employer that uh, is, it comes into the program, gives his uh, formerly hired employees 50 reais each month. Uh, this amount, uh, it doesn't have to be spent in the same month, it is cumulative. Um, if in the future you change the card issue, the, the, this amount goes to the new card issue and does not have an expiration date. And this is because um, some things that the program may allow you to buy or to go to see, it's above 50 high. So if you want to, for example, buy a guitar, you just keep uh, adding 50 reais each, each month until you have the amount enough to buy a guitar, for example. That, or if you want to see a, a great show that is coming to your city or your country, uh, in a few months, and it's above 50 heads, you can also uh, keep the money so you can see it. The potential. Uh, we have 42 million workers uh, that is formally hired. Uh, the program uh, targets the workers that earns up to five times the minimum wage. Uh, right now, the minimum wage is around seven. 750 reais, 
uh, dollar reais just to have a proportions right one dollar is three point forty cents right now just to have a figure um, and the workers which uh, earns up to five times the minimum wage is 36 million of those 42 million um, this could mean if the program reaches out of its potential 20 billion a year for the creative economy just to have a, a figure for a comparison the, the whole ministry of culture uh, spends uh, annually this year around 700 million reais for pro projects in, in, in institution plus that we have the tax incentive law which uh, moves around 1.3 billion a year so if we reach 10 percent of this whole potential we'll be doubling or tripling um, the money going around the creative uh, e economy how does how does it work first the employer has to register with us in the ministry of culture is very simple basically he has to inform uh, name um, his id industry uh, company id how many workers does it have in their uh, wages not one by one but by uh, a range one ten workers with minimum wage 20 with two minimum wages and so on um, it usually takes one or two days for us to to see and and give feedback uh, then the employer has to uh, find a card issuer this card issuer uh, it's a bit like a credit card issuer not the same thing but similar uh, the card issuer has also to be re registered with us and is also a very simple re registration uh, today we have 40 companies uh, issuing cards but only 13 uh, they already uh, gave cards for for the program once the the employer has a company of card card wishes they can give their employees 50 reais each month uh, through the cards so they can spend or where we call the receivers receivers are basically museums uh, theaters, uh, cinemas, but it can also be stores which sell CDs, DVDs, and musical instruments, as well as some online stores. I'm, I'm going to talk about it a bit further. Well, what difference do you think the Vale Cultura makes? For the worker, it's a way for, for us to uh, foster cultural development, individual deve development. Uh, we think uh, culture is a way for professional qualification uh, and of course it provides more access to cultural goods and services as it also uh, make possible more entertainment uh, it's we, we the uh, cities that have more value culture we hope that raise better life is standards for the employee it's a way to improve the relationship between employee and employers uh, we hope that the Vale Couture works as a way to attract and retain talent and of course give more motivation to their team I mean for the country as a whole um, we hope that it uh, may foster and helps museums theater and other cultural venues to have uh, an increase in their income uh, it's a way for value Brazilian culture uh, to strengthen the creative economy and uh, through it generate more jobs and income in the creative economy um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how works employees and receivers relate to the program for the workers uh, as I said, uh, the main uh, public is those who earn up to five times the minimum uh, wage. For these workers, their contribution is optional. I'm gonna, it's going to be a little more clear in the next slide. Uh, and it's uh, proportional to their income and may reach up to 10% of, of, of the benefit. For example, I'm sorry this is in Portuguese, it's a, it's a picture, so I couldn't translate. So if you earn 
uh, one minimum wage of the 50 reais you receive, the worker will may contribute to one real. If you receive three minimum wages, you uh, contribute up to three reais, so on. Uh, as I said, it is uh, optional. If, if the company wants to give the 50 reais and not ask for the worker to, to, to contribute with their con counterpart, it's not uh, mandatory. Of, for those who earn uh, more than five minimum wage, then the worker has to, 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 to con contribute with its counterpart. Um, the Valicultura is accepted um, nationwide. Um, we have a list of venues which can be accessed through our website or the website of the card issuers. Um, the card issuer which has the biggest net of receivers has about 15,000 uh, venues and stores. Um, there are some new uh, players in the market which will probably boost uh, the, the net of receivers, I think, up to 80,000 uh, venues. Um, this is going to be out in, in the industry very soon. Um, and you can, uh, it may be used to buy books, magazines, CDs, it's a very wide range of uh, goods and ser in ser service. I will show uh, most of them in a few minutes in another slide. One principle of the, uh, one, one thing about this program that we do not choose uh, which books or which magazines or which CDs uh, the uh, the seats and the work is completely free to spend it in any way uh, they want. In Brazil, we have this benefit called half price entrance or uh, ticket for e students and elderly people. Uh, if you have the Vale Cultura, it also uh, may it may be if you're a student and have a Vale Cultura, you can be a you can be working and also studying, so you can have, have the benefits. You can uh, use the, the Vale Cultura just as a credit card or money, so you're still entitled of the half price benefit. Uh, some examples what 50 reais a month can do. Uh, basically, 40 um, theater uh, tickets per year, 35 plays of theater, 28 books, 50 uh, art exhibition entrance, 12 uh, musical performance. Just, just uh, so you can see how we can change those uh, numbers I gave in the, in the beginning of the, of the presentation. Uh, it's been used so far um, mainly for books and, ma and magazines. The program, we cannot, uh, we don't have the information about what's being bought, but where it's being used. So when we say books and, and magazines, we say stores that sell books and magazines. We cannot have the information because the system doesn't get this information with type of books or more books or, or, or magazine. 16% of the, the, the money that the program already generated spent in movie theaters. 5% is what we call big stores. like. Uh, Basically, they sell everything from um, dishes to DVDs and CDs. It's a kind of story that happened in Brazil. 3% of music, uh, musical instruments, 2% um, CDs and DVDs, and 1% tickets to performing artists. This last one, uh, it's the, uh, we have the most venues over here, but um, some still do, are not able to receive the Vale Cultura, so the last one is probably one who's going to be raising in the next few months or years. For the employee, uh, we also have some tax benefits. Um, the Vale Cultura, uh, usually the wages, we have social security taxes um, that apply on the wages uh, for the employee. When you give the Vale Cultura benefits, those taxes do not apply and also you can watch you spend on Vale Cultura in case you are uh, tributed on uh, income tax we call it as real profit. Uh, you can deduct up to 1% of the investment of the benefit. 
in case you have doubts I'm gonna uh, explain it better later but about the 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 social security taxes when you pay 50 reais of wage it costs for the company 84 reais when you give vale cultura for the, the your employee uh, in case the employee has a contribution for five reais if he earns up to five five minimum wage earning the company cost is 45 reais so uh, this is for the program to uh, grow in this beginning and it's a way to attract the, the companies to invest in culture through the value culture program. Uh, from the company point of view, uh, if you give a value culture to a worker which earns one uh, minimum wage, for the company it's going to cost 49 reais and so on. Uh, it's the inverse uh, uh, count of the other thing I told before. How can venues receive it? Um, it's actually very simple. The venue has to go for getting in touch with one of the card issuers and re register by the Ministry of Culture and uh, ask for the little machine to, to receive the card. Uh, the, the kind of venues which can receive the Vale Cultura it's uh, listed, we call National Classification of Economic Activity. So, if you have a store that sells CDs, it's one kind of economic activity that it's allowed to receive value cultura. If you are a museum, you are allowed to receive value cultura, and so on. And this is what can be sold or, or bought. Uh, it's a quite wide range of things. You can see that from handicraft to movie tickets, all kind of classes, uh, CDs, DVDs, musical instruments. Uh, painting books, magazines. You can also use Vale Cultura to inter internet economy, um, streaming, download music, movies, ebooks. So uh, it's a quite, quite wide range of things you can buy with Vale Cultura. Also, all this information can be accessed through our website. And um, to end the presentation, it's about the, the, the numbers uh, nowadays of the Vale Cultura. So far, two years, we have 30, 370,000 workers using the Vale Cultura. We hope to reach until 2018, 3 million uh, workers, which is 10% basically of the five uh, minimum wage uh, uh, public that we made the potential uh, full. We have already 38,000 receivers in Brazil. Um, we don't have uh, a, a target number for it, but we think that until 2018, probably going to be up to 100,000. And so far, we have 153 million reais used in these two years of, 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 of program. Um, as I said, we have 43 card issuers registered with us, but so far only 15 um, were um, had contract with uh, companies to issue the cards to their uh, workers. Um, well, thank you. This is a uh, uh, big picture of the Vale Cultura program. As I said, it's one of new, our newest pro programs and uh, one of the we most treasure because it's not uh, it's focused on the uh, citizen, which usually uh, it's not the our the, the, the citizen which the min the Ministry of Culture has most action. So it's a, a, a very different pro program for us and one we treasure a lot. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carlos. Um, that's a very interesting presentation there, and really interested in just how democratic it is that that uh, you know it, there's not not some sort of high culture that people have to have, or uh, you know it's really up to people to decide within certain reason what what uh, arts and culture means for them, or the people the people that benefit from it anyway. Um, we've got some time now for questions, so please uh, <clears throat> uh, type any questions you've got. 
uh, into the box uh, below and uh, and send it in. Anything anything you'd like clarifying? Um, there's a, a few questions been coming in here. Um, we'll probably go back to uh, Diana as she hasn't spoken for a while. Uh, Diana, there's a question here about um, what outreach techniques do you use for reaching uh, non-English speaking people, the elderly, etc. I suppose it's a mixture. A lot of our um, activities, um, there's different things. A lot of it's based around museum objects. So you take out museum objects to where people are and use them to sort of facilitate discussion. So for instance, if someone doesn't necessarily speak English as a first language, or if for that matter you have someone with fairly advanced dementia, you can still engage in a certain level when it comes to you know, using objects because it's something that people can touch, it's something people can feel, it's very sensory. So in a sense, it's sort of, it's something that almost can transcend some of those things. And certainly I've, you know, used museum objects with groups who've had very little English, quite often, luckily, with the translator a lot of the time. Um, but yes, it can be, obviously, that can be quite interesting trying to do that. Um, but because it's you know you're doing an activity sometimes that can help you get over that in a way that just maybe talking to people wouldn't so much do you have any kind of uh, techniques for identifying all the organizations and the community groups that you that you go and meet do you just uh, different types of organization do you how, how do you go about identifying who you reach out to with your work um, well, we've got a outreach strategy that um, I developed when I first started my job, which sets out our target audiences, which is based largely around um, our visitor research, saying who isn't already coming to our venues, and also right. based around certain council priorities as well. For instance, obviously, older people um, are a big priority in terms of you know care of the elderly um, and young people, um, and the council itself runs day centres and care homes for older people and run schools. So obviously certain groups are groups that obviously are a priority for a lot of yeah. the organisation. Um, but yeah, it is, I say, we have a strategy which sets out who to target and then it's a matter of going out there and trying to find the groups that exist, in, you know, in that area of that particular demographic type that you can then work with. Um, but yeah, I think some types of groups are easier to get on board and engage with than others and some people maybe see a greater link between museums and what they do. Historically, I've found a lot of older people's groups tend to be quite you know, open to doing museum work because they see the links to reminiscence and things like that. Um, whereas sometimes other types of groups, it can be more difficult to show how that's relevant for them. So I think that's the main challenge. OK, uh, thanks, Diana. Uh, there's a question here for Carlos. How important are the tax breaks to getting companies to participate in the program? We, we see that um, many companies, they, they come in uh, in the program not because of the tax incentive, but more because it's a way to improve their relationship with their, their employees and uh, workers. It's a way to, to foster their the, the culture on, on their uh, community and it's also a, a way to because it doesn't uh, doesn't have the social uh, security taxes it's a cheaper way to improve wages okay thank you and um, I'll, I'll just flip, rotate this uh, another question for Diana really um, what what became of the uh, collection work does it go into main museum collections um, it's a bit of a mixture actually and um, certainly a lot of the items then move on into museum collections. Other items I have in storage um, which hopefully we will get some of the participants artwork out and in the community again at some point in the future. Um, so yeah it depends on what the item was really and on discussions with the museum curators and, and you know what they want in the collections as well because they have collections policies and things like that but certainly it's been kept and we hope it can come in useful again at some point in the future as well and um, because there's a lot of good things also some things were on loan so obviously the things on loan have then been returned to the people they belong to obviously. okay uh, just a question for me really i mean do, do, do you think that, that museums need to do these exercises so i call them exercises you know kind of every few years to keep keep the momentum up or is it how, how do you see that working in terms of uh, perhaps perhaps your own museum or other museums um well i suppose i'm i suppose my work is always working with new groups and doing new things so i suppose i've always got quite a lot of new projects going and things like that 
Um, I mean, I think it's a very important part of what museums do um, in terms of engaging with communities so you aren't just sort of sitting there on your own laurels going, look at all the lovely stuff we've got, but no one comes yeah. and looks at it. It's about engaging with people and making yeah. sure that people feel that connection to the collections. But I think yeah. our collections are quite good for that because our collections are very focused on the local Edinburgh area um, and it's things that people can really relate to, I think, in a lot of ways, if you are from that area, because it is the history of the people of the city and it's the art that belongs to the people of the city. So, it, you know, we really need to engage people and get them to feel that connection because I think that's very important. Yeah, thank you. I can I can testify to the to what you just said because I was actually at your galleries. I think you know this anyway, but uh, uh, sort of earlier this year, very early this year, and they were, really were very locally focused. You know, it really was really was excellent. Um, the main the main city art gallery I went to. Um, so uh, some so several sort of related questions uh, for Carlos. Um, I'm going to try and summarise these really. Um, how do uh, organisations like libraries? And museums see the Valle Cultura. Um, do they do they think that um, you? I think you mentioned that mainly mainly as people's a lot of lot of spending on books and magazines. Do 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 um, libraries and museums, theatres? Do they think that they are missing on the Valle Cultura? Do they um, perhaps do they want to charge money now when perhaps maybe they were not charging money? How, how do libraries and museums and theatres see the Valle Cultura? I think that's what, what the questions are, are driving at. Still figuring out, I think, a way to, um, to attract this new uh, form of income. But we have some in, in, interesting um, experiments here. For example, we have a net of Theatres Brazil, which when you're gonna buy a ticket with Vale Cultura, you earn the same amount, you double the amount. For example, if you have a ticket that costs 20 reais, uh, when you buy it, you they, the, the theater gives you a credit of 20 reais or to buy another ticket or whatever. So they are, they are still uh, creating is strategies to to attract this uh, potential new audience. Um, and uh, one of the things we're going to do is to uh, have these good experiences and, and, and show them so we can uh, instigate the other museums or theaters or libraries um, in a way so they can also uh, benefit from the, from the uh, new money that the, the program is, is flowing into their economy. Yeah, and and in Brazil, our, our libraries, I'm sorry, our, our museums and uh, art galleries and theatres, do they how, are they are they usually free? Sometimes free? Is it is it is it all private? Is it all government? How, how is it possible to say a bit about that, please? Yes, um, uh, libraries, uh, most of them are public, and even if they are private, they are usually free. So the, this is not a, no no cost over there. Uh, museums you have um, different types. You have free museums, but you have a lot of paid museums. But uh, tickets usually is not a great income for uh, the museums. They have to rely on uh, sponsorship or private funds or private funds or public funds also. Uh, uh, theaters in, in movie theaters, those uh, work with 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 tickets. Uh, movie theaters only with tickets. In theaters, they usually uh, have tickets, but the income usually is about one third of their costs. The two thirds uh, they have to to reach out for private sponsorship with tax benefits usually, or for public funding. Okay, um, and there's a, there's another question a little bit similar here is uh, also for Carlos is uh, do uh, the ven venues and companies promote the Vale Cultura, so participating venues and companies? That's a 
A great question. Uh, yes, they do. Uh, usually they have a sign saying here you can use Vale uh, Cultura, but the promotional ma material that's, that make this kind of signs and everything, it's of the card issuers. They are a key um, agent in this uh, program because mm -hmm. as many receivers, as many workers they have, they're going to profit, of course. So they go after the companies, they go after the labor, um, I don't know how to say, organizations, and after the receivers to promote what they are selling. Uh, so we have, uh, they are our, uh, let's say, soldiers in the field, uh, because in, in the Ministry of Culture we have actually four people working on it. It's a very small team, and they are the ones who are on the streets and cities promoting the, 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 the program as well as state go governments and uh, municipal that we also uh, stimulate for them to, to give the information around their, their communities. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a f another question for Diana really here is, is uh, what were the key measures of success for Citizen Curator and this is a two-part question. Is there evidence it gets people into the museums? Um, so there's, there's a couple, couple of questions in one there for you. Okay. Um, well, I suppose the key measures of success, there are almost two parts to that, in that there was the outreach project itself, which obviously engaged with a lot of people within the Leith area, out where they were. And throughout that, we did evaluation with the groups themselves. So we were measuring whether this people reported this would make them more likely to visit museums in the future, whether it made them feel like um, they would be more likely to you know, come in and um, you know, whether they enjoyed it and you know, how they would rate the activities. And then, of course, there was the exhibition side of things, which, as I mentioned, we did two sort of types of feedback there. We did visit research in the galleries, which did report we asked people where they came from, what age bracket they were, how they found out about the exhibition. Um, so yeah. we could measure whether this had affected the people who, the general demographic coming to the galleries, and whether that had changed from usual exhibitions. Um, so there was a slight measure of whether we could get people in in that way. And I think it had maybe changed a wee bit, but maybe not as much as we had hoped, admittedly. But we had maybe got more people in from different backgrounds. But of course, as well, there's the outreach program, which we engage with people who would not have been engaging necessarily with us. So obviously that can be measured as very successful. Also, we've got yeah. a lot of people coming in reporting that they maybe hadn't visited all our venues before and had seen marketing for the exhibition. So we'd obviously attracted quite a local audience, certainly for the exhibition, which was very positive. Um, we had a lot of people reporting they came from Leith itself or from the Edinburgh region, which of course, yeah, is a very positive feedback um, because we were getting local people in for that as well. So, yeah, it's obviously there were slightly different measures of success with both halves of that, but um, hopefully that answers that question a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just, just kind of personally interested in the volunteers that you mentioned that are doing the evaluation. I'm just wondering who they were and how you found them because I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by that. Yeah, we've got quite a big volunteering program, actually. Um, at that point in time, we had a volunteer coordinator intern who was with us from Museums Gallery Scotland, which is the museum's mm. body in Scotland. Um, and they were funding year-long volunteering internships. And so our volunteer coordinator intern had helped us recruit them. But by and large, we get a lot of people getting in touch, asking for volunteering placements with us. And we have quite a big mailing list for people who want to find out more about future placements as well. So we recruited them through that, obviously, met with them to discuss the work. And then they were in the galleries and carrying out questionnaires. But also, they were there to engage with the people who were in the galleries as well. So they had a sort of dual purpose, that they were also there to sort of encourage people to fill in the comments forms and tell them about mm. their experiences as well. Great. OK, and I've got uh, one final question here for Carlos really it's a very technical question about uh, the, uh, um, is, is it correct Carlos that the, the, the receiving organizations have a different card reader they have to have a special card reader that's different to their normal card readers for normal customers is that correct 
so far, yes. Uh, some of the cards may uh, be used in more than one machine, but it's yeah. one issue that we are uh, working on. Uh, there's some uh, new card issues that's going to work probably on any uh, machine that receives uh, credit cards. It's going to be quite a boom for this issue. Is specifically it's gonna, this, this new product coming uh, this month still. And um, the, the central uh, bank here of Brazil it's a market they are starting to uh, work on. We call it a voucher mar market. And the way they work is they uh, communicate that they uh, expect that the market starts working in a specific way. So they already said that they expect that these cards have uh, one uh, same standard uh, uh, pattern so they can work in on any machine so the first we say that we expect in, in next year we're gonna say okay if you uh, have an income of value couture if you uh, uh, work with an amount a minimum amount let's say uh, 200 million reais a year it's gonna be mandatory for your type of car to work in every machine and then this uh, value is going to go low, low, low until one moment everyone has to work on any machine. That's the way we are um, working this issue. So right now, that's a, a fact. Most cards only uh, uh, works on, on the machine of the company of the issuer card. But yeah. um, when company is going to make a, a breakthrough in this market right this month and the whole market's going to have to work in this way until the end of the next year, probably. Great. Okay, well, I can't see any more questions. So, and I'm just conscious of the time now. I think we've had, our, had the hour. Um, so I really just want to say a very, very big thank you to uh, Diana Morton of Edinburgh Museums and Galleries uh, and to Carlos Paiva of the Brazilian Ministry of Culture.